It was the psalmist who said, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. This then, though it may not feel so to us, in the sight of the Lord is a precious death. Because the life lived was a precious life. I count it a singular privilege to be able to welcome you to this memorial service for Dr. Raymond Herbert. As I think of the Loma Linda University Church, there are many names that come to mind for me as being integrated so deeply, woven so deeply into the fabric of the Loma Linda University Church that one cannot tell the story of this church without those names being prominently displayed. Chief among those would be Raymond Herbert. In the years I've had the wonderful privilege of serving here in this congregation, Sabbath after Sabbath, not week after week or month after month, but decades, uh, I would look over here, right over here, and see the Herbers and their family. They raised their kids in this church. This was mom's and dad's church, and it continues to be so to this day. The service in which you're going to participate this afternoon is going to be a simple but a deeply meaningful service. You're going to hear from family members. You're going to hear from friends. You're going to experience his life. And you're going to do so here in the context of the place that very much was his. I, I can't count the number of times I had conversations with him before or after or between services. Uh, he would have a smile playing around the corners of his lips, would usually have something to say to me that made me laugh. Sometimes it made me think, but I profoundly appreciated him and so just feel so honored and so blessed to be able to be part of this time today. As we move through the service, I invite you not only to remember Dr. Herber's life, but also to continue to send up prayers for the lives of his three children, his grandchildren, in-laws, and others who experience and feel deeply the sadness of his passing. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, your word paints a beautiful picture of the plan you have for a day to come. Moments like these, when we linger, when we weep, when we remember, when we hurt, moments like these make us long for that better day. We pray that you would be present in this place through your spirit. We pray that each heart here in the sanctuary and viewing on the live stream would know the consolation of your presence. Lord, bless us now and bless us always until that day, in the name of Jesus, amen.
Our dad was born on leap year day in 1932. His family lived on a farm in the panhandle of Oklahoma. Dad was the youngest of seven boys and his parents had run plumb out of names. It wasn't until six months later when some relatives were visiting, they had a boy named Raymond. My grandparents liked the name and finally he had a first name. I think a middle name was just too much. Never got one of those. Growing up on a farm at the end of the Dust Bowl meant there was always something to do. I think it's during those early years of life on the farm that Dad really developed his habit and discipline of industry. There was rarely an idle moment. In our home is a large needlepoint he designed depicting the family farm. It shows him riding Old Blue, their horse, with their faithful dog, Reynardo, at his side, and their herding cattle as it's time for milking. The one thing missing from the picture is the one-room schoolhouse a mile from the farm that he and his older brother, Leo, trudged to every day, regardless of the weather, as he frequently reminded us. Uh, Dad was able to attend boarding school. He went to Keene, Texas, and was able to work 30 hours a week as a lab instructor and reader. He applied himself industriously and finished top of his class, even becoming a master guide and editing the school yearbook in his senior year. From there, it was on to Union College, where he pursued his passion for science. He found time to work again 30 hours a week as a lab instructor and doing various things. He edited the clock tower and he met Marilyn Joyce Dart. The two of them shared a lifelong dream of becoming physicians. And while they were one class apart, they decided to be married, which happened a little later. After Union College, he was off to the College of Medical Evangelists in Loma Linda, California, now known as the Loma Linda University School of Medicine. The next four years were a whirlwind. Two years in Loma Linda, two years in LA. He got married after his first year when mom joined him in Loma Linda so she could start medical school. He managed to work two nights a week for a local doctor doing I'm not quite sure what. It wouldn't be allowed these days, but he did something important. And he still remained top of his class all four years. He wanted to pursue a career in internal medicine and started his residency in LA while mom was finishing medical school and then becoming a physician for the LA County schools. His residency was interrupted for two years of service in the Navy. Because he had taken such good care of the commanding officer's aunt, she arranged for him to be at El Toro Marine Base instead of being shipped off somewhere exotic overseas. So dad was able to stay close to home when I was born and not live too far away from the base. After that, he resumed internal medicine residency and was soon recruited by Varner Johns to come back to the newly consolidated school on the Loma Linda campus. He was sent off for a fellowship in gastroenterology, and so the whole family moved to St. Louis, uh, where he attended his fellowship. And then we came back to Loma Linda in 1966. The new hospital, that's the old new hospital, now we have a new new hospital, the old new hospital was not quite ready yet, so he practiced on the top of the hill beautiful that Loma Linda is named for. His clinic was in a modified cottage that's still there as far as I understand, and he saw patients in the old sanitarium building. His early career was really dedicated to building the program and taking care of patients. The three of us remember not seeing him for a month at a time. He and his partner would trade off months being on wards, they called it. We didn't know what that meant, but we knew we didn't see him for 30 days. And I would ask my mom, is he still on wards or did he move away? He was gone well before we got up and came home after we were in bed. But it was that dedication that really built the department. And as more partners joined them, lifestyle got a little bit better. 
There was a real change when Sandra started school and my mom was able to return to pursue her specialty training in OBGYN, something she had been dreaming of for years. She wanted to wait till we were all in school. And dad modified his career to help support us at home and support her dream of becoming an OBGYN physician. You better believe we learned how to do chores, cooking and cleaning during that time. Uh, Dad helped, but we, we learned to take care of ourselves, and so it was a real growth experience during that part of his career. Throughout his medical career, Dad was able to see lots of patients, but one thing that struck me was he always created time to make his patients feel special. He had a relationship with his patients that I marvel about in my own medical career and as I see my colleagues. He had lifelong friendships come out of that time and I remember several patients that we had personal relationships with that extended long after their episode of care. And I think that was really something special about dad that impressed me um, and I've tried to carry on in my own career. Some of those relationships, friendships, and um, the testimonies of his patients are some of his most prized possessions. When he would have a patient tell him a story or send him a letter about their experience with him as their physician, and he kept those in a book of remembrance that he would often bring out and show me. Once he had the means, Dad became a serious philanthropist. He didn't just give money. He was more what I call a venture philanthropist. He had a strategy, he had a plan, he expected outcomes, and he always had a way to get those things to happen. But he really cared passionately about his school and many other causes. And not only would he give, but he'd encourage others to give. Alumni, his colleagues, and even his grateful patients were encouraged to give to this school of medicine that he was devoted to and cared so much about. And that really made an impression on all of us. So there was a family life too. His career was very important, but I remember Sabbaths were always a special day for family. We'd always have family worship. Uh, we would go to our cabin in Forest Falls and go out to what we called the wash where all those wonderful rocks were. We would go on picnics with other families. We'd go hiking. Family vacations were really just to see uh, grandparents and cousins in the early years. But when I was 12, mom and dad discovered Hawaii. And they were never the same. <laughs> that became a regular destination for dad and mom. And it was the only place I really could remember dad relaxing. He couldn't come up with some carpentry project or go work in the yard. He had to relax. And he loved to, to look at the uh, artwork, walk on the beach, we'd play tennis, and that was really a blessing. It was fun to see him be able to really relax in, in Hawaii, and that's a special memory we all share. In, uh, for, for the three of us, we were well taken care of. Education was a given. We went to Adventist schools. Adventist education was a passion of dad's. We had music lessons for anything that indulged our fancy. Uh, I can't speak for my sisters, but I took probably two or three instruments too many and finally enjoyed the cello, which I did all the way through um, high school. But that we were always supported. If we were interested in something, we were able to do that. College was a given. I don't remember any conversation about if we were going. It's just like, which one do you want? And um, there was just this quiet support. And I didn't really understand how um, quietly enthusiastic dad was about our success. But I learned that one day when I came home for Christmas break, my senior year of college, and there was an envelope on my desk from the School of Medicine the admissions office. So I was really excited. I wanted to open it up and I noticed something strange. The envelope had been opened already and it was hastily closed with scotch tape. 
dad could not wait till I got home from PUC. He had to know the answer. So I knew he was excited about my career choice and that I was accepted to the school he loved. So retirement, that, um, he tried it at 65 and it finally stuck 12 years later. There was always something happening that his beloved department needed him and he showed up. Somebody was ill, somebody was deployed to Iraq. There was always some reason, oh, it's taking too long to get in new patients, I'll show up and help with that. So he, he was really dedicated and so finally at 77 he retired. I've talked about his work ethic. Well, he turned that energy into collecting after that time. So for any of you who've ever been to our family home, you can see the diligence with which he pursued collections <laughs> of books, dolls, too many to name. But needless to say, he was very um, hardworking on this forefront and very successful. And the three of us are um, enjoying finding out what comes next to all these collections. But anyhow, he, he uh, really applied himself to that very diligently. In his later years, Dad often spoke about Ecclesiastes 3 and the seasons of life. He really wanted to be an influence of good in his later years, and he continued to care deeply about um, organizations and uh, causes that were near to his heart. And he continued to work on those um, without ceasing. This is where the notorious binders you fought, hear about came up, where he would develop a plan and he would take these and share them with leaders and give uh, helpful suggestions on how, how they could be successful with his plans. But it came from such a good place. He really uh, showed us how to care about things that matter, and um, I really appreciate that example he had as a role model. This past few weeks, my sisters and I have been uh, overwhelmed with a flood of stories about Raymond Herber. We're hearing them from so many people, friends, neighbors, previous patients, administrators, some of his financial planners, um, there's one common theme here. They all had a relationship with Ray, and it was meaningful to them, and they have wonderful stories to share with us. He had a lasting impact as a mentor, guide, counselor, philanthropist, confidant, role model, and friend. We miss the ability to be able to pick up the phone and call him just to talk or ask for advice. It happens to me almost every day. And then I pause and think, what would Ray do? And you know what? I frequently come up with a pretty good solution. Ray Herber's legacy remains alive and well. Good afternoon. I'm here. We, we are the grandchildren of Raymond Herber. I'm here to share his favorite Bible text, Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under the sun. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance.
a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to quit and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. My name is Harrison. Um, I'm gonna be sharing a couple of things, a couple of thoughts of my grandpa and what he meant to me. So my grandpa and I were friends. I would go to his house, he would come to my house. We would eat together, talk together, and laugh together. I could always um, look back and notice how interested he was in my own life. Um, he would always ask me questions about how my studies were doing, um, what new hobby I was into that week, and then he would always uh, continue on and tell me how dangerous that new hobby was. He always found a way. Um, he would talk to me about how my savings are going, if I was financially set for the future. Uh, his favorite question, if, if I had any new money to put into my Roth IRA account, savings account, which he started for me. He always found a way to weave that question into our conversation, but he did it with good heart. As I grew older, I realized just how important of a man my grandpa truly was. And that started to make those small conversations and our time together that much more important to me. So I started using the example he set for me and started prioritizing talking about him and less about myself. And that way I learned so much more about my grandpa. I'm so happy to say that over the past four years of high school and the couple years I've been studying in college, our relationship has gotten so much stronger. Um, I remember just a couple months ago sitting out on his porch and you know, looking at the sunset, looking at the cars go by, and it was fun to just be able to pick, uh, pick his brain about anything and everything I could think of. And I'm sure you guys know and hear that you could really ask him anything and he'll let you know what he thinks about it. I remember one time, I think this was one of our last talks we had, I started by asking him about the current state of America. You know, we're in a lot of uh, political unrest right now with this virus going around and other things happening in the world, and I, I just wanted to know what he thought. And so we started talking about that, and somehow we wound up um, with him teaching me with pictures how to pickle and jar veg vegetables like he used to do in Oklahoma. I have no idea but he was prepared for that conversation. Um, <laughs> great memory. He never passed up an opportunity to teach me something. My grandpa loved teaching. I truly believe this was one of the main missions he was put on this earth to do. Whether it be his students in his class or his family, uh, his neighbors around him, I'm sure we can all agree that he was a great teacher, and in my um, opinion, one of the best. To me specifically, he taught me how to work. He taught me how to save. He taught me how to help others. He taught me how to be a good man, whether that be through watching him love his wife, my grandma, putting family first before anything else, loving his neighbor and treating them like he wished to be treated, the golden rule. And most importantly, through um, watching him worship and exemplify the actions of a God that he taught us all how to love. Mm -hmm. My grandpa was a teacher, and he never missed a valuable opportunity to teach me a lesson. I'm looking forward to seeing him again in heaven one day and explaining to him how his lessons have helped me in my personal journey. I will for always and uh, for, forever and always be grateful to God for blessing me and my family with a friend, a grandpa, a father, a teacher, by the name of Raymond Herber. It's my privilege to uh, give some remarks on behalf of all of the grandkids. Speaking of what Raymond Herber meant to his grandchildren is a difficult task. Grandpa de defies easy characterization as I have seen in the beautiful eulogies written since his passing no less describing to those who didn't know him as grandpa what he was like and meant to us. 
As our grandfather, he absolutely was a figure we admired, respected, and wanted to emulate. But while enough for any patriarch, those words do so little to describe the glow of warmth we feel in our hearts for our beloved grandpa. He was one of the most gracious and generous people any of us have ever known. So much of his life was lived in service to others, but with a true humility such that to us, we always heard of these acts from those who had received or witnessed them. Rarely, if ever, did he speak of his own works, and if so, it was always out of an earnest desire to teach, to lead us by example and show us this path of gracious service that he had found most fulfilling. We have, of course, seen firsthand his commitment to education, not only in his support of the schools we attended, but in communities whose mission he believed in. And over time, it became clear his support of education was not solely for knowledge's own sake, but due to a deep abiding belief in its power to grow and mold students into the best people we could be. We witnessed his deep and abiding belief in community. He quietly and relentlessly pursued the best for his family and the greater circles he lived and moved in. He had an astonishing knowledge of family connection within the Adventist community that was rarely stumped. Whether it was the casual mention of a friend in a story or trepidatiously introducing a new boyfriend or girlfriend, Grandpa relished the opportunity to find a connection through friends or family, often succeeding with fewer than three degrees of separation. His belief in community was also an expression of his faith. We saw over and over how much importance he gave to simple acts of service and emulation of Christ's teachings, whether it was dropping off bulletins to homebound members of the Loma Linda community on Saturday mornings, leading our family in prayer, or the many phone conversations he had with people across the country, including the grandkids, just to check in on them and let them know they were remembered and cared about. In writing this, I have struggled to summarize the picture of my grandfather that my cousin, sister, and I share, but reflection has led me to a single word, caregiver. It was our Grandpa Raymond's God-given mission to care for others. Grandma, his family, his patients, his community, and his grandchildren, he invested himself in us wholly, body, mind, and spirit. In word, action, and by quiet example, I have been taught a measure of love for others that his quiet countenance and intimidating intelligence sometimes belied. And so, our grandfather imparted to us an example of a good life, well and truly lived, that I will spend the rest of mine trying to emulate to the best of my ability. We love you, Grandpa, and we miss you in sorrow equal to your absence in our lives, which is to say beyond what words can measure. We look forward to seeing you again in joy. Thank you so much. My name is Stephanie Kaimpopa, and not only was Dr. Herber a good family friend and one of my dad's closest friends and one of my dad's big supporters of his art, he was also a huge supporter of the Loma Linda Academy String Program, which I'm the director of, and he was always a, a, just a huge help financially and emotionally and mentally and everything in um, whenever we had concerts here at Festival Octavia and all the other events that we have, we couldn't have done it without him. So this is a musical tribute to the man who really appreciated and loved the art so much.
So when you stop and think about the legacy that a life well lived leaves, it's about so much more than just the nice things they do. In a similar way, the legacy around someone's vocation and career is multifactorial like that too. So when I think about the legacy of Dr. Raymond Herber around his career and his vocation, I think about a lot of things. I think about excellence. I think about innovation. I think about creativity. I think about inquisitiveness. But most importantly, I think about friendship. I think of the many, many friends that he had. And when you were Dr. Herber's friend, he knew a lot about you. He made it and took his time to learn about you. And he took time to care about you. So when we put a video together of many of Dr. Herber's work friends, the line was very long of the people that wanted to stop and tell a few stories. We could have filled up literally hours of time in this video, but I think we got some very, very nice moments that illustrate the legacy of truly caring about the people around you. So take a minute and watch. Who was Ray Herber? A kindly older gentleman, a perpetual advocate for the school, an occasional gadfly, something else. I'll share a few snapshots where my path crossed Ray's. With these and other vignettes, you may get a sense of a man whose life truly made a difference. Ray Herber's journey at Loma Linda is intertwined in powerful ways with the Department of Internal Medicine. Ray has served as the head of the Division of Gastroenterology. He was the Department Chief Financial Officer for years, and he was key to several recruitments that made a difference. In 2009, I was appointed Chair of the Department of Medicine at Loma Linda. Ray knew that connections would be important. And he cooked a dinner, hosted the dinner, and invited a few key faculty to his home. He created the platform for connections and gave me a way to help move the department forward that he cared so much about. One day, uh, soon after, he asked me to stop by his home. And uh, I found out that he was an artist. Uh, he had a watercolor, and it was me. Now that watercolor will never be in the National Gallery next to the Obamas, but the fact that he took the trouble to paint it told me that he cared about the work I was doing and that it truly could make a difference. We would meet at the New York bus terminal on Saturday night, catch the, I think it was the eight o'clock bus, scheduled to go to Atlantic City. It took about four and a half hours to make it. And so Ray and Stu Shankel and myself would sit in the back of the bus and we talked about our dream of going to Loma Linda and the plans, what we hope to see, what we hope to accomplish. Uh, Ray and Stu came to Loma Linda in 66, uh, I believe it was. I came in 67. When I came to Loma Linda and arrived, Ray was there to welcome me and to help me to feel at home, and it was just great. He talked about where they had lived and who helped with building houses and where things were and where shopping was, and just kind of introduced us to the community. And his recommendation for a builder we took seriously, and I still live in the house uh, that um, we built at the time. Uh, on the faculty, Ray was in gastroenterology, I was in infectious disease. Ray played a major part in the finances of the Department of Medicine. Finances are not my strong suit, and so um, I was happy it was Ray because Ray was very careful, very thoughtful, very particular, and I figured he's doing a much better job than I would ever do. 
unfortunately didn't help me become a billionaire. And so uh, that's okay. I, I finally forgiven him for that lapse. And it was just wonderful to be a colleague and work with Ray. It's one of the joyous memories I have of being at Loma Linda. Ray Herber will always be Ray Herber. I've known Ray Herber for 60 some years. Worked with him for some 20 years. Of all the years I know, knew him, I never knew if he had a middle name. After coming into my office on several occasions with ideas and so forth that he had, I decided one day to give him a middle initial. The middle initial I gave him was S. Raymond S. Herber. The S standing for surprise because I never knew when he walked through my office door what he would come up with next. I first uh, became uh, aware of him uh, when I was a medical student and I was served on his service for a month. Uh, I found him to be uh, what I would call maybe a good skeptic. Uh, he wanted reasons for what you did and uh, he wanted you to express them. But uh, I thought that in a sense in retrospect was a, a good teaching method uh, to help us take responsibility for what we knew and what we didn't know. As a resident, I found him to be a very efficient doctor, too. He probably saw more patients than most people in our group did, and uh, he had a way of being able to uh, go through a lot of uh, numbers of patients, but yet also to, to uh, have basically good humor with them, too. I really appreciate the fact that most of his patients seemed to like him okay. He took care of problems outside of GI, too, which uh, for me, uh, was uh, a big help since uh, I started out being a uh, missionary doctor in Thailand after I finished my internship. And uh, uh, it was helpful to learn from him some of the things that you could do, even though you were a subspecialist, uh, to take care of common problems. And uh, as a colleague, uh, I found Ray uh, extremely knowledgeable, not only in his medicine area, but also in, in the financial running of the, of the medicine department. Uh, he was probably the most influential person in our whole department the whole time I was uh, a member of the uh, faculty at Loma Linda, which was uh, almost 40 years. As a member of the Alumni Association, uh, Ray has, was also uh, an extremely important part of that, again, for uh, running a lot of the financial aspects of the Alumni Association. I remember I spent two years as the uh, president of the holding, uh, com the, the holding Fund Committee and uh, realized that uh, this was really uh, something that Ray had more of a handle on than anyone else uh, in the whole uh, Alumni Association, including us that were supposed to be leading out in this. I've known Dr. Herber since 1967. At that time, Loma Linda was consolidated. The campus was moved for all four years to Loma Linda. And Dr. Johns handpicked about a dozen young internists to become subspecialists for the new faculty. So Dr. Herber was one of the elite members who was picked. He was sent away for training and returned. When he came back, uh, he was one of my first teachers on the rotation of the GI service. I found him to be extremely intelligent, uh, very thoughtful, very dedicated. He was a no-nonsense physician who wanted to have the facts backed up by evidence. But he was a great teacher and also a great researcher. One of the things he enjoyed was research at that time. Uh, we were on the ward, he said, I have a project for you boys. And he took us in his storage room where there were about 30 or 40 cans, gallon cans of feces that he collected from patients to do, do research on. And he took great pride in the fact that this didn't bother him at all. 
to have to deal with this. So this was my first dirty job that I experienced. Over the years, you know, we've had many faculty come and go, but those of us who were here part of the original transition team have spent our life trying to emulate these clinicians like Dr. Herber and his colleagues. They were the elite faculty that came here in 1967. And I will miss him, and uh, I wish the best wishes to his family and uh, also to his wife, Marilyn. Ray Herber and I worked together in the Department of Gastroenterology at Loma Linda Medical Center for many years. Ray contributed a lot to the functioning of the department, and we appreciated his work so greatly. On a personal level, he was our best friend, actually a very important part of our family. He was our caregiver when we needed help. When we reached out for help, Ray was always able and ready to lend the helping hand to bandage a wound and transport us to the hospital or to the emergency room or whatever we needed, always with a smile and soft, caring voice. He had a big heart and we miss him dearly. Uh, Dr. Raymond Herber had a, seemed to have a lifelong passion for Loma Linda University, uh, the university, the medical center, the de Department of Medicine, and the Division of Gastroenterology. He contributed a great deal to all those entities, and especially to gastroenterology where I worked with him for many years. I guess I'll always be indebted to Dr. Herber for helping me in my career and uh, being part of Loma Linda myself for so many years and also in my career development and uh, also very supportive of our family as we've been here as well. So uh, I want to express my thanks to what a great individual for the university, a real champion. With so many of my colleagues, I mourn the loss of Ray Herber. 42 years ago when I joined the faculty at Loma Linda University, Ray was the Department of Medicine's finance chair. He welcomed me graciously and made me feel home at Loma Linda. He supported my interests and encouraged me to maintain medical roles at Redlands Community Hospital and the San Bernardino County Hospital as well. When an opportunity arose to perform pulmonary function tests for OSHA at the Borax plant in Trona, Ray said, go for it. He was a visionary who knew that growing <coughs> Loma Linda's outreach in our wider community was important for our future and good for the community as well. Later in my career, when I was pulmonary critical care division chief, Ray, who for years had committed his heart and soul to ensuring a secure and prosperous financial future for the Department of Medicine and for the School of Medicine as well, came to me with a proposal to combine many of our small division funds to create an endowment and maximize potential for growth. I had long recognized Ray's acumen and applauded his vision. I said yes, and with Ray's guidance, we established an endowment that substantially improved the division's fiscal future. One of the most successful ways to encourage others to support a cause or a mission is to set an example, to step up. One of the qualities I admire most about Ray and his wife Marilyn was their devotion to the School of Medicine. They gave generously and consistently, and equally important, Ray created opportunities that made it easy for his colleagues in the Department of Medicine to support the school and our alumni association as well. He worked tirelessly to assure his vision of a strong and financially resilient future for Loma Linda, and unfailingly did so with humility and a whimsical smile. Over the many years that Ray and I practiced at Loma Linda, it's not surprising that we shared many patients. Inevitably, in relating their medical stories, my patients told me of Ray's soft voice, gentle caring, and abiding kindness. As we grow older, 
it's easy to become socially isolated. That didn't happen to Ray Herber. When I walked home from work many days, I would pass his home at the corner of Richardson and Huron Street. Almost every day, there was one or two cars parked outside his home. And he would be sitting there in his chair, talking to somebody, planning something, and always with a smile and in some encouragement. Sometimes it was my turn to stop by and talk to him. And the topics were familiar. Doug, what are you doing for the Department of Medicine? How are the endowments doing? Where are we going in the future? I find it fascinating when I stop to think about the impact uh, that a single individual can have on the world around them. There's a quote that says, sometimes when I consider the tremendous consequences that come from little things, I am forced to think that perhaps there are no little things. Dr. Ray Herber impacted the world around him in significant ways, his family, his friends, his patients, his students, his colleagues, the School of Medicine, the Alumni Association, the Department of Medicine. As an alumnus of the School of Medicine in 1957, his value was recognized early by his teachers who sent him out to do a fellowship and talked him into returning as faculty here in 1962. And from that day on, he paid attention. When I stopped and listened to the comments on the videos, I thought, wow, what a legacy. He's someone who appreciated and recognized excellence. He was an extremely loyal friend to so many people. He was a very proud father and an even prouder grandfather. He was creative, sharp, and he always paid attention. He was a lifelong learner who meticulously researched a topic. I personally was a recipient of some of his gifts, articles, and long handwritten pages of his research topic. What a gift to have someone who cares enough uh, to come and talk to you um, with a well-researched topic like that. It was really, really quite remarkable. He was very forward-thinking, uh, a man maybe before his time when it came to things like setting up scholarships, setting up endowments, and uh, when he was uh, thinking about this, I think that both he and um, Dr. Marilyn Herber uh, were uh, remarkable in their forward-thinking gifts um, to graduates in the school. Dr. Herber was a dedicated faculty member and an excellent clinician who always watched out for the best interests of the School of Medicine and the Alumni Association. He was diligent in looking for best practices and a visionary when it came to building for the future. His time, his care, and his generosity have made significant differences in the lives of students, in the School of Medicine, in the Alumni Association, and to all of his friends and families, and we are grateful. It is such an honor to stand here today as the president of the Loma Linda University School of Medicine Alumni Association to celebrate Dr. Raymond Herber's life, specifically how it impacted the Alumni Association. Many of you may not know that Ray's son, Steve, and I are classmates of 86 and lifelong friends. Steve is currently also a fellow officer of the Alumni Association, slated to be a president in 2023. Note, he will be the first alumni president to ever have had two parents who were past presidents. So it is not just as president, but also as friend and longstanding faculty member that I grieve you, with you here today in the loss of Ray. The first understanding I had of Dr. Herber's passion for the Alumni Association came when I was a very junior faculty member here at Loma Linda. Yes, he was very much Dr. Herber to me. It was decades before I could call him by his first name. Shortly after joining the internal medicine department in the Gen Med clinic over at the FMO, Dr. Herber worked out a way for all alumni faculty in the department to donate $50 pre-tax every paycheck until they obtained silver perpetual membership in the Alumni Association. 
Now, perpetual membership means that you invested a chunk of money towards an endowment fund meant to help sustain the Alumni Association over decades. And while silver was the lowest possible per perpetual membership at that time, as a new grad with a salary far smaller than new grads can command today, that $50 were dollars that didn't go towards debt reduction or retirement. But his encouragement enabled me a formal. When I was elected to the officer track seven years ago, he came up to me and told me with a twinkle in his eye, Deb, I'll be coming to talk to you when you get to be the president. And boy, he did. Our conversations, both in person and by phone after COVID hit, were all centered around one thing. How, as alumni, can we help our students best? May I share some of the ways with you in which he helped our students? One, the Herber Award. Starting back in 1994, the award was quietly started by Ray to recognize not just those who excelled academically, but who also did something to improve others' lives, who saw and acted on others' needs. Over the years, 152 women and 42 men were recommended by the Dean's Committee for this award, which came with a $500 check. Dr. Herber sent each one a personal letter telling them about this Alumni Association Award and ended the letter with, remember, love is the only thing that increases as you give it away. Then he anonymously funded the gift forwards from his own pocket. The students have always been so grateful for this gift, along with the words of affirmation and encouragement. One of our last conversations was about this award, and he was concerned that the award continue after his death. I am so proud to announce that just last week, the Alumni Student Affairs Council voted to sponsor the Herber Award in perpetuity for a minimum of 10 seniors every year. Two, encouraging membership in the Alumni Association. Ray put his money where his mouth was by becoming a double diamond perpetual member while Marilyn became a triple diamond perpetual member. But in addition to reaching out and asking alumni faculty to ante up, he canvassed his classmates. Incredibly, the class of 1957 is the only class to ever hit 100% participation through perpetual membership. In recognition of this passion, the Alumni Association is establishing a new annual award to be named the Raymond Hermer Loyalty Award, recognizing the alumnus who pledges the largest perpetual membership each year. Three wanting to inspire students and young alumni, Ray spent hours scouring for stories of alumni who had done great things. He was so proud of our school. He really was, Tammy. And so proud of the mission. He wanted the students to be proud as well. By finding alumni with great stories and nominating them for honored alumni, his goal was to inspire while reflecting positively on our school. That tradition is being carried on as the annual President's Council is meeting tomorrow to finalize the 2021 honored alumni who will be announced at our virtual APC next March. The Council, composed of all living past presidents, will forever risk, miss Ray's voice at the table. Finally, reducing student debt. Ray was a mover and a shaker in raising funds from the alumni to help with student debt. He recognized that high debt loads discourage students from embracing primary care tracks. Debt also diminished young alumni's willingness to become faculty members here at Loma Linda, where the salary levels just can't be quite competitive with the Kaisers of the world. It is in part because of the monies that he helped to raise, monies that are in a School of Medicine endowment that the school is partnering with us to jointly sponsor the new Alumni Association Paying It Forward Scholarship. This will be officially announced next month, but he was so excited about this new scholarship program, which invites an alumnus to join with the school and the Alumni Association by investing one third of the scholarship and offering a mentoring relationship with a scholarship recipient joining the generations together. Steve tells me 
He found in his dad's files a long list of names Ray felt would be great alumni sponsors. You'll be hearing more about this new scholarship program in the November issue of the journal. How, as alumni, can we help our students best? Knowing that the physicians we grow here at Loma Linda and then send out into the world to care for patients, whom I call God's kids, knowing that these physicians will reflect to those kids a bit of what the father is like, what better call to action could Ray have left us? How, as alumni, can we help our students best? Ray Herber did that best. We will continue to miss him here in this world, but look forward to seeing his wonderful grin again one day soon. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Ray, 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 you are my best friend. Though not an immediate colleague or faculty member, I and he were best buddies, soulmates. But there was a time when I never had heard of the guy. I graduated four years ahead of Ray back in the 1950s in the days of the divided campus. Our paths hadn't crossed. But then Ray made them cross. At that time, I was at Kettering Medical Center. Out of the blue, he called me. The telephone I was to find was his favorite device. If he didn't cotton to computers, as he famously did not, he sure did to the telephone. Although altogether, he must have spent a decade talking on that phone. After introducing himself in that uniquely deep, masculine, mellifluous voice of his, he said he'd been toting boxes for the Alumni Association, moved to the city to Loma Linda. In rummaging through those moving boxes, he'd come across a long forgotten series of caricatures I'd done of the CME, College of Medical Evangelists, faculty as a student and thought it ought to be preserved and published, which he did as a hardback book called Giants of CME, and to my surprise then, I didn't know him very well, he funded, and at his own cost, he provided copies to all the alumni through the class of 1955. Ray had as great an obsession with the LLU heritage, divine blueprint ordained heritage, 
the right hand of the message heritage, as he did for endowments for professional chairs. And he had a lot of enthusiasm for that. So, 20 years after Giants of CME, Ray and I partnered a 10-year project to create the Faculty Portrait Gallery of over 50 portraits and various other paintings around the campus to a total of over 60. I was merely the painter, still based in Ohio. He, my agent, promoter, activist, idea man, and when necessary, and occasionally was, apologist. And he scheduled and enforced, as only Ray could, the faculty posings every half hour on the dot. Ray physically hung the gallery twice. First, back in the old times, and when it was posted, hung, exhibited in the Dell Webb Library, and later, only recently. Plus, he funded the gallery, frames and all. This time, I was prepared for it, but not the way he did it. So, I discovered it later. And I warn you, everybody, the Loma Linda Academy String Program, and even chemo, that all of us can expect to be stumbling across such landmines of Ray's goodness as long as time lasts, which may not be too much longer. In recent times, back on the phone again, he'd call me at least weekly, then we called each other, always saying, just call to check on how you're doing. Well, Ray, what I'm doing right now is joining the Herber family and Ray's many professional colleagues, which, though presenting innumerable anecdotes and accomplishments of Ray's, haven't covered the half of it. No single person nor an army of people could. If Ray was profligate at honoring other graduates at banquet and gala, he shrank from the spotlight himself. Now, finally, what he did unto others is being done unto him. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you. The gentleman you just heard was another discovery of Ray. He's the John Singer Sergeant of the Loma Linda University. His artistic ability has been unknown until discovered by Dr. Herbert. I heard a voice behind me calling my name. It was several years ago. 
I had been out of this state most of my adult life, and I'd come home to Southern California, and I was just leaving the Sabbath school, which at that time was held in the lower floor of the library on the campus. All the faces were strange to me. I didn't know anybody. And here was somebody calling my name as I was leaving. I turned around and I saw a smiling face. And he says with his hand out, Hello, Warren. I'm Ray Herber. And that took a smile from me because I had heard that name over and over and over again from my physician brother who had spotted this young doctor who is the best in his class for the entire four years of the School of Medicine. I had heard the name of Robert, of Ray Herbert. I felt like I knew him, so I smiled but I really didn't know him. The next few years, I had the pleasure and the good fortune of really meeting Dr. Herbert. He was a people person. I saw that with his family. Early on, I, I learned never to call Ray in the morning. That was family time. That was special time. The time to talk to him was in the afternoon. I learned also that Ray Herbert never saw a dollar bill. He didn't want to give to the church or to the School of Medicine. The organ in this church, he told me one time, he funded the endowment that keeps that organ tuned. You've heard wonderful stories about a truly great man. And he was great because he was good. There's no such thing as greatness without goodness. The resume of Ray Herber has been written for a long time. You can read about it in Galatians 5 or Colossians 3. And it goes something like this. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control, compassion, on and on and on. Those are the words describing a man whose life was the sermon. Paul was making the point, and this is the one thing I really want to emphasize. Paul was making the point that true religion is not a form of godliness. True religion requires it coming from the inside. Keeping the commandments is not a ritual. Keeping the commandments is the power of God accepted into your life in which everything you say and do, you are growing in grace, reflecting the image of God. When I finally recognized this was the man I was dealing with, I told Wes, Ray is pure gold. I didn't mean money, I meant character. So I wrote a letter to Ray, and I told him about my assessment. I've had the privilege of traveling this world and I've met scores and scores and scores of wonderful Christian people who also fit that resume 
that Paul the Apostle wrote. People who kept the commandments of God and were faithful to Jesus. I told Ray in that letter that I ranked him right up there with the best that I had met. And then I told him, knowing how humble he was, I said, Ray, I want you to read this letter to your family. He called me after he got the letter, and he said, thank you. And I said, do you promise you'll read it to your family? And he kind of chuckled. And he said, yes. Now, I've never asked the family if you ever heard the letter. Steve said, yes, thank you. It was true. It was from the heart. On August 20 of this year, I received a telephone call from Ray. He was telling me that he had received a report from the laboratory that was negative and that his time was limited. He was not whining. He was not crying. He was matter of fact. I said to him, Ray, you know, we talked a little bit about the God, the family of God that we both belong to. I said, Ray, how would it be if sometime in the next few days I drop by, we can both wear our masks, and maybe we could sit on that little slab of cement where you have two chairs just outside your back door and visit. And he, of course, said yes. That day never came. Before we said goodbye, I told him, I said, Ray, I'm going to tell you what I would say to my brother. I love you, man. I loved him. Last month, in the National Military Cemetery in Riverside, I attended an incredible service. I heard a physician who had been mentored by Ray, who had earned his star as a general of the United States Army, pay tribute. I heard a son-in-law who was on the pastoral staff of this church pay respect from the heart. I heard three United States Marines in the uniforms so special to our United States Marines raise their guns and give a three gun salute to the memory of this naval officer of the United States military. And then I heard taps, perfect, beautiful trumpet by another Marine. Ray didn't hear any of that. He didn't hear the trump. He didn't hear the trumpet play taps. But it reminded me of a trumpet that he will hear. When Ray and I were kids, and that was a long time ago, there was a song that we learned in church that we sang so often that we couldn't help but remember the words years later. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, all the saved of earth shall gather over on that other shore. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there.
Ray will hear that trumpet. He'll be there with a multitude of other wonderful Christian people who obeyed the commandments of God by living their lives of faith and dedication to God, to their church, to their country, to their families, to all people throughout the world. It will be a grand reunion. Ray will be there. He'll be looking for me. He'll be looking for you. I am proud and honored to consider myself Ray's organist for the last 40 years. But not just his organist, also a friend. His children tell me that I first met Ray, I think in the 1960s. Um, I grew up in that small mission field in the middle of the Pacific called Hawaii. And it was on one of those trips that I met, the, I met Ray and, and the Herber family. Ray's cousin, whose husband was the mission treasurer, lived there at the time and attended our small church. And I was playing the organ, probably 16 years old, um, an aspiring organist. And I guess that was my first audition for Ray as to become his church organist. Um, I'll have to admit that that memory is vague, but I do remember that time. It wasn't until I became the organist here at the University Church in 1979 that I really got to know Ray and Marilyn and his family. Um, as Pastor Randy mentioned, they were always there in their seat. I often chatted with them before the service or after the service. Ray always had some comment about what I had played or some suggestion or did you ever think of this? And um, it, was always, it was always great to talk to him. Ray was my wife, Cheryl's physician. Marilyn delivered our youngest daughter. And so they have been a very important part of, of our family for, for many years. Ray was, um, as you have heard, um, in, the, in the Navy. And his request was that the Navy hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, be played at his memorial service. And so I am so honored to honor him by playing this hymn on this instrument that he so generously endowed. And I am so grateful for that. This instrument will be heard for years to come because of his generosity. It was just a few, couple of weeks before his death that he invited me. Actually, he had been inviting me for quite a while. And one day on my walk, he happened to be outside. I walked by his house and said, hey, Kimo, when are you going to come and play the organ? Because I want to donate this to either La Sierra University or to some student who, who who could use it. And so I finally did. And, and we had a great time of talking about the instrument and then just chatting and catching up. Um, I remember him showing me his needlepoint, which I had no idea that he was so talented at that. It was incredible. And now, having known that that was the last time I would have a conversation with him that makes that visit even more special to me. But now, here is Eternal Father Strong to Save, the Navy Hymn.
So much has been said, and yet it feels like there's always something more to say in a life like that of Dr. Herber's. I pondered, I thought we could spend a bit of time talking about the reality of mortality and draw the thoughts from his favorite passage, Madeline, that you read so well. There's a time to be born and a time to die. Or we could spend time talking about the importance of tears, that tears give evidence to the love we felt, that tears, Doug, as Heritage said so many times, are a language God understands. And we could go to John 11 and witness the tears of Jesus himself. Or we would do really well to linger over the theme of hope. Go to Revelation 21 and join John the Revelator as he sees the new heaven and the new earth. As he witnesses God wiping away those tears, welcoming, welcoming us to his kingdom to come. But as important and as valid as each of those themes is, it seemed appropriate to spend just a few moments talking about the legacy of a life. That's what we've heard here this afternoon, the legacy of a life well lived. It's a legacy that has touched so many different edges of the shore, medicine, science, patient care, financial administration, the arts, art himself, friendships, colleagues, a relationship with God. And what is most clearly evident to me here this afternoon is family, the importance of family. It's a legacy that will endure, will be long-lasting. It's a legacy that will touch me this coming Election Day, Harrison, as I think about canning vegetables instead of worrying about other things. <laughs> what a legacy. Scripture speaks to legacies like that, and in a number of different ways and passages. Speaks to that kind of legacy in the words of David the king when recognizing the untimely death of Saul's general Abner said this, and the king said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? That speaks to legacy, speaks to Dr. Herber. Or go to that last book of Scripture in a chapter important to those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists, coming as the echoes of three angels' voices die away. Then I heard a voice, says John, from heaven say, Write. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. If I could paraphrase that, I would say their deeds will follow them in just the way we have experienced here this afternoon. A person's life outliving his years. But maybe one of the most unique places. Scripture speaks to the legacy of a life. Comes in a neglected, in fact, in truth, little known passage of Scripture. Tucked away in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings. It comes after the death, in fact, quite some time apparently, after the death of Elisha the prophet. It's a strange scene, to be honest with you, until you think about it 
about what it says about the legacy of a life. It was a dangerous time, a time when life was cheap, a time when the future was uncertain. With that in mind, consider these words. Now, Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. It's a desperate act. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Now just think about that. Long after Elisha passed from the scene, contact with him, with what was left, brought life immediately. I don't know that there's a more unique but a more clear way of speaking to the legacy of a life well lived that long after the individual has passed off the scene, the realities of that life continue to bring life. That's the legacy of a life. It's a legacy that will be lived out most clearly and fully and immediately. In the lives of three children, Three children-in-law, one of whom is my dear friend and colleague, five grandchildren, and who knows how many more generations to come. The legacy of a life well lived. Because of that, I thought of the words of Paul that great firebrand of faith, the apostle for God, who when he curled his toes over the edge of eternity, pinned these words. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. That includes Dr. Ray Herber. That includes us those of us who are thankful for his life, a life well lived. Gracious God, we have heard your work in the life of Dr. Herber. We have been touched by your work in his life. We are thankful for the choices he made the choices that affected spouse and children and children-in-law and grandchildren and so many others who came within the orb of his influence. As much as we thank you for his life, we thank you even more deeply for the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That life death, and resurrection that give us hope here this afternoon. Lord, may, may these themes and these realities continue to echo in each life here. In the name of Jesus, amen.